Hey everybody, Sneaky Narcotic, back at it again with another YouTube video. Today we are going to go over the life and death of Gideon Jorah. <clears throat> um, before we get into the video though, I'd like you guys to please like, share, and subscribe. It would mean a lot to me and I would greatly appreciate it. I do have a disclaimer for this video as well. So, I didn't get all the pictures from Wizards of the Coast or from cards. I did have to pull some pictures off of Google just to give you guys kind of a picture to go with the story at some points in the story. Because the story didn't have pictures. Um, another thing is, is that sometimes when I do these types of videos, especially when I do it in a one-off like I normally do to record it, there is some mess-ups. Um, sometimes the... <laughs> The lore gets changed up too, which I suspect might happen with this one, and I'll go into further details towards the end of the video of why I think that is. But um, if if something in this video is wrong, please let me know in the comments section below, not just for me, but for you guys as well, so that way you can see where I messed up. <laughs> but without further ado guys, let's get into the life of Kytheon Iora slash Gideon Jorah. So, Gideon was born Kytheon, and Kytheon was born in Akros, on Theros. Theros is this plane that's kind of based around Greek mythology, and so there's different types of gods and everything, and I'll get into that in just a minute, but first, I did want to mention that he didn't really know his father, he lived with his mother, but after a while, uh, during his adolescency, his mother actually died. And so he joined a gang, became the de facto leader, and then kind of ran it like Robin Hood, where they would steal from the rich and give it to the poor. But he got caught. So there's two different um, stories. There's the original story... And there's the revised version from Magic Origins. And I'm, I'm think I'm going to follow the revised version from Magic Origins. So, the prison he was held in is called Kefolion. Um, It's right there in that picture. Kefolion was a terrible prison. The, uh, the prisoners were led by this guy named the King. And Gideon didn't like how he was terrorizing everybody. And so he stood up and started fighting, and this got the attention of the warden named, uh, I believe it's Hexus. And Hexus actually believed that Gideon would become a great hieromancer, so he started teaching him more about hieromancy. And uh, this went on for a while, and all of a sudden one day, the fort became under attack by harpies and cyclopses. And so, Hexus actually uh, told all of the prisoners that... Hexus. It's Hexus, not Hexus. I'm sorry. Hexus actually told all of the prisoners that if they were willing to defend the keep, they would win their freedom. And so, Gideon helped defeat all the harpies and cyclopses and was actually championed by Heliod, the god of, of the sun, um, to... Go and fight the Titan of Erebos with his gang of Irregulars. And so, here's the god Heliod right here. And here's the Titan of Erebos. After defeating the Titan though, he saw the actual god Erebos, god of death. And felt that he could take him on. He felt that he had enough power to take on the god of death. So, he took the spear that he had used from Heliod to kill the Titan and started to throw it at Erebos and this is what happens.
So after his hubris led to the death of all of his irregulars, he was so distraught that it awoke his planeswalker spark, and he planeswalked to Bent, which is on Alara. Um, there, a guard misheard him speak his name. He uh, he was still a little down, so the guard asked him his name, and he went, hum, hum, hum. and I guess that somehow ended up to be Gideon Dora, according to the Reddit post I read. And that's how he came up with his name. He decided to keep it because... The actions that he did as Kytheon were just embarrassing, and he thought that maybe if he took on a new name, he could he could redeem himself and feel better, and so that's what he did. Um, the original story has him going back after he planeswalks to Hyksus, and uh, Hyksus actually warns him of pyromancy, saying that it killed his master who was also a planeswalker that he suspected that Gideon would become a planeswalker because he'd never seen such strong hieromancy except from his master who was a planeswalker. Then he gave him this weapon called a Sorol and I'll I'll show that to you here. The Sorol is this really weird weapon. I think it's named after or it's based off of a weapon in Indonesian martial arts called a Yoromi. I think I'm saying that correctly. And so basically, a Yoromi is a mix between a sword and a metal whip. And so it's basically a whip with a blade. And it's pretty cool. Um, if you ever are bored on YouTube, just go watch some of these videos with the Yoromi. It's pretty cool looking. But um, Gideon has multiple whips on his on his Sorol, as they put it in the MTG wiki. And... Um, Hyksis is the one that gave it to him. He uses this weapon throughout most of his planeswalking days. Uh, the next story that we get into is the purifying fire. So Gideon hears about this naturally occurring white mana that took the shape of fire on the plane of Regatha. The group that was over the flame was the Order of Heliod. The leader of the Order was Walbert. Now, Walbert didn't initially want to give Gideon access to the flame, but he decided that if Gideon were to capture Chandra Nalar, that he would allow him access. So Gideon found Chandra to be at Kefalia, where he found her due to her cataclysmic theft of the Dragon Scroll, which destroyed the Sanctum of Stars. Unfortunately, though, he wasn't the only one in, in an effort to save innocent lives he, uh, he he incapacitated her and kept the scroll. He eventually returned it, though. He kept the scroll because he had hoped that they wouldn't execute her until it was found. He eventually returned it because she escaped. So after returning the scroll, Gideon tracked her down to a place called Diridin. Now, Diridin is a plane, and here it is on the next slide. Diridin is a plane that's covered primarily in black mana, um, has this spell that prevents planeswalkers from planeswalking away from it, and so he catches up with Chandra, who was mad at him, of course, and says that the best way for them to really get off of the plane of Diridin is to stick together and fight it out, um, figure it out together and they can get it off. So, Chandra goes to her last ally, a goblin named Yurl. Yurl chooses this time to attack Chandra, and so Gideon incapacitates Yurl. After that, they go to a nearby village, um, where they speak to the wise woman. Let me look through my notes real quick. Her name was Falia. She was a Minarch, and she was also a Blood Mage. Uh, using her powers as a Blood Mage, she obtained the knowledge from her ancestors and also kept her youthful look. She she looked like a child. This was the best picture I could find, but she probably even looked younger than that. And so, after uh, after meeting Falia, Falia falls in love with Gideon and is quite jealous of Chandra. So she sends Gideon on a hunting expedition 
and sends a group called the Fog Riders to go and abduct Chandra. Gideon finds out about this and kills one of the Fog Riders and incapacitates the other one. This made the prince uh, of the plane, the, the ruler of the plane, Prince Verlov, very mad. And so he tied Gideon to a stake in the courtyard of his castle and let any vampire who was hungry feed on him. The prince treated Chandra to his bedchambers, and when she woke up, she parlayed with the prince to get Gideon moved to a dungeon instead. But in doing so, she told him about the existence of planeswalkers. Uh, Verlov then planned to steal Gideon's essence to become a planeswalker himself. During the ritual to do so, though, Chandra actually beheads him. I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep up with my notes at the same time. So that's uh, Verlov in the top left. And the top right is a picture uh, dictating how it would probably look like if Gideon was tied to a stake. And the bottom left is her parlaying with Verlov. And at the end is, of course, where he gets beheaded. Once he gets beheaded, the spell that was holding them on Duridan, uh it broke. So they planes walked off and returned back to Regatha. <laughs> um... They returned to Regatha, Chandra returned to Kural Keep, which had been besieged by the Order, who just wanted Chandra. Chandra surrendered when Gideon returned her to Walbert. He revealed that the plan that he planned to offer Chandra to the purifying fire, where she would be left powerless. Gideon found a passage that said, If Chandra had no regrets, she'd be Fine, so she survived and destroyed Walbert. Uh, this is a picture, actually the cover picture for the story is just a novel, which is why these pictures don't really go along with it. But she destroyed the temple that the fire was being held in and killed everybody inside. When Gideon came to, he ran into the ruins and found Chandra incapacitated. And so he woke her up and she basically talked about how she... She had come from a place where they had the same ideals as the Order of Heliod, and that those people killed her parents, and he t she told him to watch out for those kinds of people. And uh, he said that he would cover for her if she would go now, and so she left. Um, this, of course, leads to the next chapter. After covering for her, he tracks her down to Zendikar. I uh, to the battle for Kef. Here we go. So he tracks her down to Zendikar. Um, she he lost her near Akum, near the Eye of Ugin. Uh, where to his bones, he found the nearest settlement, Fort Kef, hoping to find some more earned, some well earned rest for himself around the fire. Gideon heard tales, strange and disturbing tales, from an adventurer named Teferi. Or right, not Tuffery, but Taffery. He warned that the land had been acting odd, becoming far more violent than it ever had been before. With nightmares toes still swimming in his head, Gideon went to sleep to dream of Chandra surrounded in white flames. His rest wasn't uh, to last long, though, as a primal scream tore his sleep, uh, tore him from sleep. A Surakar, which is depicted in this picture, a Surakar had wandered too closely to the fort, and the adventurers dealt with it very harshly. While it lay injured, Gideon went to it. The, best war the beast warned him of the gods who came from beyond the world, from the void with no color, who would devour all the life in, the in their path. Among the assembled soldiers, only Gideon knew the true horrible scope of the what the reptilian meant. All the next day, refugees poured in with tales of demonic insects. The tales were but the heralds of the terror to come. As the brood swarmed the fort later that day, Gideon fought bravely amongst the soldiers of Fort Kef, and he alone turned the tide against the brood. A cry of celebration went up until Emrakul darkened the skies. Gideon told all the beings of the fort to flee to follow the Surakar to the underground rivers. Left alone, Gideon simply stared at the titan before him, and desperately he tried to think of some way to fight the creature before him. 
Only one solution came to him, and Gideon left to seek the assistance of a group of planeswalkers he had heard rumors about on the plain of Ravnica. Um, and this is presumably the Infinite Consortium, which I don't know too much about, to be honest. So, his first time on Ravnica. Upon arrival, his immediate efforts came to no fruition. Whatever fate befell the group he was searching for uh, remained a mystery, but as he traveled, he became aware of the overwhelm overwhelming tension between the guilds, paranoia and hostilities rising with the guild list caught between the political juggernauts. Though Zendikar was in desperate straits, if the guilds were, went to war, the entire population of Zendikar would only be a fraction of the casualties of Ravnica. With little recourse, Gideon postponed his search, looking to the guilds for some way to curb the coming war. While battling a gang of Rakdos cultists, Gideon attracted the attention of the Boris Legion. He was approached by Aurelia, believed that he could be a potent weapon for the Legion, and offered him a battalion to lead. Perhaps more if he joined. Gideon felt the Boris had the greatest chance of enforcing some form of peace and accepted command over the soldiers, shirking her offer of membership. He believed in the purpose, the defense of the laws, but at the same time, war on Aurelia's own zeal and aggression against the other guilds. Gideon's alliance has become stressed to the breaking point, and it may just be a matter of time before he joins the gate list in the efforts to escape the violence of the guilds. Now, that's where the Gamepedia, the mtggamepedia.com, actually leaves off on that. Um, as far as I can tell, they don't necessarily go to war until really war the spark. But I didn't play any of the old Ravnica, so go look up some Ravnica videos and see the background on that. As far as the battle for Zendikar, try and fight a battle on two fronts, Ravnica and Zendikar at once. Gideon discovered that the Hedrons of Zendikar had power, uh, had power of the Eldrazi spawn and that they were connected by ley lines. Realizing he couldn't win the battle on his own, he went to recruit the biggest expert on ley lines, Jay Spalarin. After falling to, failing to persuade Chandra and Nalar to join them, the pair planeswalked to Zendikar again. They, th there they found out that Seagate had fallen. They arrived in time to rescue several survivors from Seagate and escort them to Skyrock, a safe zone. Having found out that Jory N, Gideon's merfolk friend, was trapped at Seagate, Gideon left to find her and brought her back to Jace, hoping that together they might be able to link Zendikar's ley lines with the Hedrons in order to find a way to stop Eldrazi. Again, after Jace and Joran N figured out that they had to travel to the Eye of Ugin in Akram, which is depicted in the bottom right, Gideon stayed behind to organize the refugees as he took over command and an increasing number of refugees straggled in. He decided to take the offense and to reconquer Seagate. So... Battle-hardened veterans and desperate new recruits flocked to Gideon's banner, even the vampires of Malakir joined in. At some point, Gideon had heard about Noyandar, a leader of the group of wizards known as Royal Mages, who were able to control the royal and even use it as a weapon against the Eldrazi. Gideon paid Noyan and his com comrades a visit, seeking to recruit them as allies and helping to retake Seagate. After witnessing a demonstration of Noyan and the other royal mage power, Gideon requested that Noyan join the Skyrock. Noyan, who had up until that point thought Gideon an idiot, agreed only to realize soon after that Gideon had used his own hubris against him as manipulation to get him to offer his help. Keora, a planeswalker native to Zendikar, brought her own army of merfolk and colossal sea monsters to fight. Gideon's army began an attack on the Eldrazi-controlled Seagate, joined soon thereafter by Nyssa. The Adrazi was driven from the city, and Seagate's defenses ramparts were rebuilt and f fortified. The soldiers of Zendikar celebrated a hard-won victory. Then Joran N arrived with the news that Olamog was approaching. The Planeswalkers enacted a bold new plan. While Gideon's troops and Kyor's forces held the city against the fresh assault, Nyssa called on the elemental powers of the Earth to raise sunken hedrons. 
from the ground and moved them into a ring above the Eldrazi Titan. Jace activated the Hedron magic and Ulamog was trapped. Then everything collapsed as Obnixilis appeared. <laughs> Having followed Nyssa from Balaged, he summoned Kozilek and defeated Jace, Nyssa, and Gideon. Nixilis even thought for a moment that he had killed Gideon. Gideon, however, survived, but was captured and tortured with the other two. Until Chandra arrived in Zendikar, found the trio in freedom. The, fourth, the four together could finally defeat Nixilis, who retreated and swore that he would travel the multiverse to find a fitting punishment for them. Uh, after this, they formed the Gatewatch in an attempt to... Fight power, uh, fight e greater evils that were bigger than them that they could handle, that they couldn't handle by themselves, but could handle together. Seeing that he could not keep his promise to Ugin to neither harm the Eldrazi nor allowing them to escape from Zendigar, Jace decided to slay the Titans with the Gatewatch and Kaoru's help. After consulting with Nyssa, he described the ley line pattern to help her that would bind Kozilek and Ulamog to Zendikar, drawing the bulk of the Titans into the plane that they're... After consulting with the... And drawing the bulk of the Titans into the plane so that their energy could be dispersed into Zendikar, killing them in the process to attract them... The remaining forces of Zendikar's defenders under Gideon's lead would pose as a bait. While the plan worked at first, the Gideon, with Gideon keeping the Eldrazi swarm away from the army, Kaora clearing out any other swarms and Chandra supporting them, once the Eldrazi titans were anchored to Zendikar, their destructive essence threatened to assimilate Zendikar into themselves. Afraid, Kaora tried to persuade Nissa to release the titans and allow them to flee, but Jace objected. Chandra offered to burn the Titans instead, and after pre preventing Kaora from attacking Nyssa, Jace agreed the Pyromancer then connected with the Animus, allowing her to channel her Pyromantic magic through Zendikar's ley lines directly into the Titans. In one brilliant blaze and flame, Ulamog and Kozilek were incinerated and destroyed, leaving only ashes raining around Zendikar. After the defeat of the... Eldrazi Titans, Gideon stayed a while on Zendikar to help rebuild its civilization. The next chapter, Shadows Over Innistrad. Gideon arrived along with the rest of the Gatewatch on Innistrad after Jace alerted them of the presence of the third Eldrazi Titan, Emrakul. <laughs> when the Gatewatch tried to use ley lines to bind Emrakul like the other Titans, Gideon tried to protect his team members from the assaulting of Jazzy Hordes, but would nearly be overwhelmed had it not been for the help of the necromancer Liliana Vess. Mistrusting her intentions at first, he later relented to Jace since the relented to Jace since the telepath knew Liliana better than he did. While trying to battle a miracle, the Gatewatch fell under his corrupt influence. Gideon was trapped in a scene where he was confronted again by Erebos, along with the other members of the Gatewatch. Erebos asked Gideon to tell him his true desire or he would wipe out his new friends. Since none of Gideon's answers found the approval of the god, Gideon had to watch as his friends fell one by one. When he was freed from the trap by Jace... Gideon fought to keep the Eldrazi away while Jace, Nyssa, and their new ally, Tamio, worked their spell to seal Emrakul into the moon of Innistrad. After the battle was won, he approached Tamio, offering her a place in the Gatewatch. When the Ceradium declined, Jace and Gideon talked and decided to offer Liliana the place instead. So here's Jace, T uh, Tamio, and Tamio, Nyssa trapping uh, the trapping the titan into the moon of course that is the eldritch moon for all those that don't get the joke then we go on to kaladesh gideon came to kaladesh with the rest of the gatewatch after learning of the presence of the rogue planeswalker tezzeret there having been present during the final finale of the adventurous fair Gatewatch continued to lend aid to the Renegades. So at the finale, Tezzeret decided to distill all of the 
all of the inventions and basically be a total douche. And I think he killed Pia Nalara there, which is actually Chandra's mother. Um, moving, moving from safe house to safe house, Gideon was skeptical about this, having stood on both sides of the law and asking himself if he should have cooperated with Bon. Uh, Bon, of course, was kind of on Tezzeret's side, but not really, but he was on the consulate side, which is what Tezzeret took over to be in charge. Um, Chandra saw Tezzeret and the consulate as one and the same, which is why she didn't agree with Gideon. Uh, Gideon reminded her that the purpose of the Gatewatch was not traveling from plane to plane to impose their judgment on the world's inhabitants, otherwise they wouldn't be no better than tyrants. Likewise, he tried to restrain Liliana from killing consult, consulate soldiers without need. Liliana instead reprimanded, reprimanded him for underestimating the threat in that Tezzeret posed. After days, the Gatewatch learned from Sahili Ray that Tezzeret has sequestered himself into the Aether Spire. Experimenting with the inventions of Rashmi, Liliana volunteered to go together with Sahili, while the Renegades planned a diversion by attacking the central Aether Hub of Agarifor. Gideon would instead lead various attacks to spread consulate forces thinly across the city, meeting a grin with Chandra... The two had to exchange over their previous meeting on Diridan and Chandra's actions on Gafalia. Gideon offered her physical comfort from Baral, uh, before Baral taunted Chandra to attack. At the same time, the Aether Hub was under attack from Gearhulks and Gideon decided to protect it. He destroyed the Gearhulks by placing his indestructible body between the gears, causing it to collapse. Uh, just in case I didn't mention it before, and in case you missed it before, let me explain a little bit about Hieromancy. Hieromancy is actually a faith-based magic that Gideon is adept in, and it's all about debuffs and buffs. So he buffs himself, and in fact also gives himself an invulnerability, and is also able to debuff his opponents. Um, so that's what he did here with the Gearhulks, and I think it's very interesting as he went inside of their gears and went indestructible, causing them to collapse. Uh, as the consulate lost their flagship, Gideon met with Chandra, Liliana, and Sahili to discuss how to destroy Tezzeret's construction. The renegade officer had constructed a special thopter that they could send to shut down Tezzeret's invention. Again distressed by the willingness of Liliana to harm innocents, Gideon tried to argue against her plan to confront the Grand Consul, but with no success after the Thopter had been destroyed by a raid of Dovin Bon. Chandra and Gideon improvised entering the Thopter themselves. Chandra would blow up the construct with her fire magic, while Gideon would use Hyromancy to keep them both alive. Their plan was successful in destroying the Planner Bridge, which is the picture on the bottom left, but Tezzeret managed to escape. Uh, later on, we actually found out that he s escaped with the Planner Bridge. After the vault was over, Gideon inducted a Johnny into the Gatewatch, telling him that they would be honored if he joined their ranks. Afterwards, the Gatewatch came together to coordinate their future activities. Gideon agreed with Liliana and Jace that it would be too dangerous to leave Tezzeret alone and that their best chance would be to attack his master directly on Amonkhet. Oh my god, guys. We're getting very close. So, just a real quick background. I actually didn't get into magic until, uh, really until Zendikar, but I didn't start paying attention to the lore until Kaladesh. And oh my god, guys. It's, it's weird that we're this close into Gideon's past, and I'm already seeing, um, seeing me playing Magic right now. I did, like, Aether Hub and Spire of Industry, Planar Bridge, all these cards. So anyways, continuing on with the story, Omniket. Gideon arrived at Omniket together with the rest of the Gatewatch, finding himself in a deserted... A desert filled with undead, fighting against both undead and hungry worms, Gideon witnessed how a divine being intercepted in their favor. Destroying the undead and awakening a long-forgotten yearning within him, which, if you know this picture to the uh, top right, it's actually called Renewed Faith, which I find very interesting that he found Renewed Faith in Ketra. 
uh, excuse me, Oketra, um, when they arrived at Naktamun, Gideon and the Gatewatch were brought before Oketra, who recognized Gideon as one of her own, addressing him as Kytheon Iora, feeling deep devotion again for the first time since he had dared to challenge Erebos. Gideon advised the rest of the Gatewatch to learn what they could about the plane before they would make their move. He himself went to Oketra's temple, pledging himself to her to face the trials of the five gods. He had given a he was given a cartouche that symbolized his advancement, allowing him to enter the fourth trial with a new crop headed by Jiru. Um, I hope I'm saying that right. It's spelled D J E R U, so I'm gonna say Jiru. Learning about the faith of the people, he began to feel uneasy though, but thought nothing of it when the crop was brought before Bantu. Gideon and his, and his new crop were brought to enter the trial when Bantu told how none are born strong. Gideon asked if her asked her if this was also held true for the gods. Bantu commemorated his brazenness and allowed him to allowed his crop to begin. During the trial, he was horrified about the careless way the crop members treated the lives of their fellows, leaving wounded behind that would have been saved. When the crop came from Bantu, the god told them that their number were too great and that sacrifices of the fellow crop members were in order. Gideon was shocked when the rest of the crop cut down their own comrades in arms and when he tried to intervene, the god's servants came to restrain him. When Bantu turned to him to demand a heart, Gideon defied her. To the shock of the crop, when they accused him of being a heretic, Bantu replied that he had no, uh, had not found faith and was therefore no heretic. Calling him out for judging a culture he did not grow up in and refused to understand, Bantu told him that even the crop members faced doubt, but that their ambition had helped them to transcend it and that this was what her trial taught. Gideon left the monument, now at first realizing that the anointed were those that had fallen in the trials. Rejoining with the Gatewatch, Gideon planned to free the dissenters, uh, which are people that strayed from the path of the Amonkhet, and save the aspirants from the death that would await them in the trials. Gideon vowed to protect Samet from the dedicated before they were overwhelmed by all five gods to act as opponents in the final trial. Bound with cartouches. And this is actually all five of the cartouches, which I didn't know until I saw this picture. They form a picture, guys. It's pretty cool. So, anyways... Bound with cartouches that hindered the use of magic, they were forced to face the worthy in battle. After the magic that had compelled them to fight dissipated, Gideon put himself between Hazret and Diru, saving him, quote-unquote. He was actually kind of mad about it because it was what he was working towards. Saving him from the final reward of the trials, in this moment, Hazret prophesied him that he would die by immortal hands and warned him that he was no god. In the final confrontation with Bolas... And th yes, this is the rest of it. Uh, Yuru about to get anointed. Um, oh, what's her name? Samet uh, pushing her dear friend out of the way. And Gideon getting in the way. Using his vulnerability to take care of Hazard's spear. Which comes in later. Uh, it does. <laughs> so they go and try to take on an hour of devastation. They try to take on Nicol Bolas. And each one of them gets defeated terribly. Uh, and Gideon actually, this is where he loses his Seral that I was talking about earlier. After this, he has no weapon until the next chapter. Um, but they all barely managed to planeswalk away and they met up on Dominaria. Um, so Dominaria... After the Gatewatch arrived on Dominaria, they realized that Jace was missing. Nyssa and Chandra soon left for their own reasons as well. This left Gideon and Liliana to confront the demon Belzenlock on their own. Gideon was convinced that Belzenlock had to be defeated to free Liliana's full potential in order to confront Bolas once again. 
Even before Liliana was able to heal him, the duo had to save the people of Vess from Belzenlock's revenants, led by Liliana's own brother, Josu. Gideon later devised a plan to defeat Josu after Josu's defeat. Against Johnny's wishes, Gideon and the se uh, severely wounded Liliana teamed up with the Weatherlight's crew to fight the Cabal and defeat Bozlog. Bozlog was actually trying to revive the Cabal and was doing uh, a, a semi-okay job. After learning of the existence of the Black Blade, they realized the Soul Drinker could be a possible weapon in their fight against the Elder Demon. Together with Chandra, Gideon infiltrated the Belzenlock stronghold to find the Black Blade. By a series of unfortunate events, he ended up in the fighting pit. However, he could escape and claim the Black Blade, which he ultimately used to kill Belzenlock. This, of course, after killing the final demon uh, of Liliana's contract, she did not know, defaulted her existence uh she was she was claimed by bolus and bolus's clutches is the artwork on the bottom right and as you can see she had no choice but to be under bolus's control from there on out so this starts the final chapter war of the spark it's the newest set that just came out so first things first gideon arrives and they're already at war uh, Gideon traveled with the Gatewatch to Ravnica for the final confrontation with Bolas and immediately became trapped there due to Bolas's use of the Immortal Sun, which, if you look in the artwork of of the islands, is a new prop. Um, alongside many other Planeswalkers and Ravnicans, he fought against the Eternals of Bolas's Dreadhorde. He joined up with the Boros forces led by Aurelia, riding a Pegasus that she named Gideon's Promise. During the invasion, he during the invasion, the trapped planeswalkers got together with rapid leaders to strategize. At Jace's recommendation, they decided to split it into teams to focus on specific tasks. So this team was led by Gideon, Angrath, Aurelia, and Hwalti to take on Ronus, which had become a god eternal. Um Ronos, who was leading the Battalion of Eternals to destroy the Gathering opposition. Gideon and Aurelia led the aerial units, while Angrath led the ground units. After battling his way to Ronus, Gideon was able to kill the god, stabbing him in the eye with the Black Blade and draining his essence. R Ronus, Lazatep's shell collapsed to the ground, an empty husk. So it is, um, it is something that I should mention. When I say Eternals here, Eternals... On Amonkhet, the whole point was to go through all the trials, be killed, and embalmed in a material called Lazatep, and become an Eternal. Uh, Eternals are basically zombies that are harder to kill than they already are as undead zombies. So, this is the army that Nicobolus was using to take over Ravnica and enact the Elder Spell, which is what he was going to use to become a god, basically. Um, later Gideon instructed Chandra to reactivate the Immortal Sun, uh, which he had already disabled, and yes guys, I know if you watched my video, Immortal Sun, Immortal Sun, Immortal Sun, I didn't say Planar Bridge here, anyways, uh, Chandra to reactivate the Immortal Sun, intending to use the bolus, use it to trap bolus. He rode Promise toward the dragon, only for the god eternal Ketra, Oketra to shoot the Pegasus down. However, the demon lord Rakdos caught him and brought him within striking distance of Bolus. He struck Bolus in the head with Black Blade, but <laughs> this is the part where Bolus told him how he enchanted Black Blade to never hurt an elder dragon again. Um... <laughs> After Bolus used the power of the demon's contract against Liliana, Gideon sacrificed himself to save her. Using his Hieromancy to take the contract and its lethal effects upon himself, as his body crumbled away to dust, Gideon had a vision of his regulars in Theros afterlife, welcoming and forgiving him. Um, ultimately, Gideon's sacrifice was the deciding factor 
of the battle. Now free from her contract but retaining control of the Dreadhorde, Liliana turned the God Eternals on Bolas and with a distraction from Niv Mizzet, she was able to despark and defeat the Elder Dragon. So, this is the part I was talking about earlier where Hezret's uh, spear came in because Hezret's spear actually helped distract Bolas long enough for Oketra and Bantu uh, using being controlled by Liliana to despark Bolas. Now, it's a little bit of a speculation his afterlife is. This is the picture that I was just talking about where uh, he had a vision of his regulars in Theros afterlife welcoming and forgiving him. Um, there was this really weird love triangle where Chandra loved Gideon and professed her love as more than just a brother. And then she kissed Nyssa or something like that. And they fell in love. But then they went their separate ways. And Chandra's being tortured by Tybalt now. Yeah, go check that video out. Um, but they did a resurrect a statue of him on Theros. And it is believed that Chandra... Chandra mentioned that they should take his uh, armor to Theros so that he could enter the Underworld. So it is believed, or at least speculated, that he is in the Underworld right now on Theros. And that's all we got so far. So that's why I say that this may not be the end, although he is considered dead now. This may not be the end. Elspeth is actually in um, Theros in the Theros underworld too, uh, dying, I forget exactly how she died, but she's supposedly in the underworld of Theros as well. So, thanks guys for watching, um, please like, share, and subscribe. I hope this was a better video if you watched my previous video. This has been Sneaky Narcotic, signing off.